Welcome with Blue Sky Hypnosis. Welcome to Friday Live at 5. Today we're going to be talking about propaganda. Um, subheading is, are you being controlled? That would be controlling your mind. The reason I find this topic absolutely fascinating is because as a hypnotist, we are trained, we operate and work in the province of people's subconscious minds in the province of their belief systems. So we all have a myriad of belief systems, many of which, most of which work for us. They've gotten us to this point in our lifetime, but some things, some beliefs that we have hold us back. And it could be in relationships, it could be in business success, it could even be things that pertain to your health, like um, a habit, like smoking, or something that pertains to weight loss, or even believe it or not, other aspects that pertain to your health. Uh, before I get any deeper into this today, um, I just wanted to say that uh, if you have significant psychological or medical issues, you want to make sure that you check with your licensed professional. I'm coming at this as a hypnotist and a life coach. I've been doing this for 16 years. Um, and so everything that I talk about is from that perspective. If you think that I can help you as an adjunct to whatever you're dealing with, feel free to reach out to me. Blueskyhypnosis.com is my website. You can find more information there. So back to belief systems and how most of them work for us, but some of them hold us back. So our job as hypnotists is to find those um, limiting beliefs that you have and help you reverse those deep in your subconscious mind so that when you're in a particular situation, you don't really have to think about it. You just, you more or less have a different way of being because you don't have this strong pull in the other direction. So I want to define propaganda, first of all, uh, give you my definition. So one of, well, one of the things when you look it up is from the Catholic Church and it's called propagation of the faith. Um, propagation means to spread. The, the other way of thinking about this and the other sort of definition that you find out there is a way essentially of, of either promoting or better yet, selling an idea or a doctrine. So the most powerful way to do this is to convince someone's deeper subconscious mind that this is the product or the service or the idea or the belief or the doctrine or the plan that they really want. In other words, the more you can convince someone that this is something they really want, the more powerful it is. And it's way more powerful than different types of coercion, like overt coercion, where you say, if you don't do this, I'm gonna put you in handcuffs, or if you don't do this, I'm gonna hurt you. It's way more powerful to convince someone very subtly using very sophisticated techniques that there is that there that this thing is something that they have got to have and one of the things that i put in my in my teaser was um was who is edward bernays edward bernays is considered to be the father of public relations and he's the one who really took that sort of old-fashioned advertising which was here, here is this glass. And the reason this glass is so good is because it's made out of this kind of sand and, and, it, and it has this beautiful color and so on. And, and I can put you know, nine ounces of liquid in it instead of eight. He took it from that to selling to these deeper unconscious desires. And Bernays was actually the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And so he had this insight, this very, very deep insight into human behavior, again, at the deepest levels of the psyche. And this is the, this is the, um, the level at which he was operating on. And to illustrate one of his most famous campaigns was he was representing uh, an American cigarette, cigarette manufacturer, Lucky Strikes. And through data and research, he, he came to the conclusion, hey, there's a taboo against women smoking. That's 50% of the smoking uh, potential population. How can I get them to smoke? Well, this was in the late 1920s and women at the time wanted, uh, it was women's suffrage, the suffragette movement. They wanted equality with men. They wanted to be able to vote for obvious reasons. Well, he was able to kind of link these two things together. Women's desire to be equal to men, women's desire to have freedom with, with cigarettes. And how did he do this? Well, he said, Men get to smoke and you don't. So it's kind of an equality 
for you to be able to smoke. And he came up with this, this term, and I have a little graphic here, where he called it freedom torches. Um, and, and, he had, and he organized parades where very fashionable women were walking in these parades, and, they're, and they're, the, the ostensible, pur ostensible purpose is for them to assert their equality with men, but the real purpose was to get women to smoke. It, it, he didn't care, I don't think, at all about women's equality. He just thought, that's something that I can use to leverage um, women into doing something that I want them to do for my client. So, you know, and I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to be hopping all around today because this is a massive topic. I mean, the more I was researching it, the more I was thinking about it, the more I, I was taking notes, the more I was just like running out of places on the page to put all of this. Um, but there's, a, there's, there's something called the Hegelian dialectic. And it, it basically is a very simple statement. It's problem, reaction, solution. So the place where a sophisticated, call them what you want, propagandist, marketer, what have you, where they start is, what is the, what is the outcome we want? Okay, so for Bernays in 1929 or whatever it was, it was, I want to tap into the women's market. I want them to smoke cigarettes in large numbers because then my client is going to reap in massive prop profits. So call that the solution. What is the problem? The problem is inequality. Um, the more I can stoke that idea of inequality, and the inequality was real, let's, let's, let's be clear about that. The more, the more I can stoke that that problem, if you will, about inequality and say, look, men get to smoke and you don't. Isn't that awful? I'm going to create a reaction in you. And, and I, can I can push that even further the way he did by saying, it's, these are freedom torches. This is your path to liberty. This is your path to asserting your right as a sovereign individual. Then I can offer the solution. Here they are. Here are the freedom torches. So Hegelian dialectic. Problem, reaction, solution. And this is the way a lot of very sophisticated marketing campaigns work. And it's not just selling a product or a service. It's also selling a doctrine or an idea. So if you want to take a country to war, that's something that in a, in a, a quote unquote liberal democracy generally has to be sold first. You can't just do it like this. You have to sell people on it. If you have a political candidate, they are sold like products and services. If you have any other kind of initiative, those are also sold in very, very sophisticated ways. Um, what, I, what I didn't mention at the beginning of this broadcast today is if you have questions, please put them in the, in the comment section. If you, have, if you have comments, put them in the comment section because we definitely want to get a back and forth going. That's what makes this... Um, something other than just me talking uh, to myself, which actually bores me after a while if it's just me talking. <laughs> so please feel free to, to ask questions, make comments, and what have you. Um, one of the other things that I put in the teaser was, and, and again, this, this is such a, a vast topic that we're going to kind of scratch the surface today. And, and where, where you want to take this will be based upon the questions and the comments that you ask and that you make. So... Um, one of the simple ways that, that uh, anyone trying to sell something always returns to over and over again is a simple con a construct, a simple idea um, that is expressed in very simple ways and then is repeated over and over and over and over again. So this guy Bernays, I'm going to come back to him because he wrote a book called Propaganda. And in this, in this book, he laid out all the, all the tools and techniques that he, that he used. That book reportedly was carried around all during World War II by the Nazis' uh, minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. And one of the things that was employed early on was radio. So radio was brand new in the 1930s in the lead up to World War II. And what propagandists, what marketers discovered was that it was an extremely powerful tool for changing people's minds. Um, up until that point, the only thing that was available, of course, was reading, was newspapers. And, and the, now you've introduced a human voice into the mix. 
And one of the, the simple ways or the simple phrases that was used that was repeated over and over again was um, ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. And what that means in German is one people, one government, one leader of the government. Um, there, there's, no, there's no reason <laughs> why that has to be true, but what they wanted was they wanted a dictatorship. And so that was just repeated over and over again into people's minds. And if you, if you think about that phrase, uh, one people, one government, one leader, one, one sort of supreme leader, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's actually a hypnotic language pattern where you're linking the idea of one people. Oh yeah, we're one people, that sounds really good. And where, where one government leads one people, oh, that sounds good too. And one man <laughs> leads the government, which leads the people. It's, it's, a, it's a very subtle way of driving, especially by repeating it over and over again, where someone can, you know, in their sleep, it's not confusing. Almost like, and I'm not trying to equate this company with that leadership in Germany in the 1930s, but when you think about um, Nike, they, they have this very simple phrase, just do it. Just do, well, just do what? Well, I guess that's up to interpretation, right? In the minds of the people who are hearing this. But a, but a simple phrase repeated over and over again is a very, very powerful tool for driving something deeper into the mind. I mean, just think about it. All modern education is based upon repetition. Why is that? It's because you have a gatekeeper which exists between your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. It's kind of like a filter. So information presented from the outside has to go through this gatekeeper, except under certain circumstances. And if you want to get something into the subconscious mind and make it a, um, an unconscious competence, you have to get it through the gatekeeper. So repetition is one of the mechanisms that's used to drive, to drive or beat down that gatekeeper and get that information into the subconscious mind. And it doesn't matter what it is. If you want to learn to speak French, if you want to learn to tie your shoes, if you want to learn how to fly fish, the, the idea is you repeat it over and over and over again, that breaks through this gatekeeper and drives it into the subconscious mind. So that's, that's one of the ways in which a simple phrase repeated over and over again that is designed to produce a, uh, an emotional belief in the listener and the person that hears it. That's, that's one of the reasons why that's so effective. All right, let's see who's here and what comments we have. Uh, all right, AJ is here. Hello to you. And Mental Fruitcake, love the name. And Jacques and Amber, good to see you guys. Um, so Amber said, signed up for notification for this video and I got nothing. Hmm, not sure why that is. Uh, I don't know if you signed up with me or if you signed up with YouTube. You should be able to do both. Um, and happy to see you back. Happy to see you too. And also says here, uh, it is multi layers. First, you have to feel some ailments. And then second, they build their controlling ideas, I guess. Next um, is saying, also, if I have some weakness, it will be easy to be controlled. That's a really, really good point. A person who's frightened, a person who's desperate, is far easier to control than a person who doesn't need anything. If a person has, you know, food, you know, adequate food, um, they have comfortable shelter, uh, their prospects for moving forward, they, they feel confident about those prospects, they have security. Um, they they essentially they think of medical services. They're not really worried about anything. Those are people who are extremely difficult to control. If on the other hand, a person is frightened, they're they're terrified, they're worried about the future. That person is much easier to control because first of all, their conscious rational mind moves out of the way. And the part that comes forward is the subconscious mind. So another way of saying that is that when you're in a, uh, a, a calm situation, when you're not stressed out, your prefrontal cortex, the executive functions of your brain are online. 
if a large explosion happens outside <clears throat> or somebody uh, opens and slams the door and surprises you, your neurology immediately moves into a stress response, taking your thinking from your prefrontal cortex into the part of your brain that is known as the hind brain or the lizard part of your brain. That part of your brain is only concerned with survival. That's not the part of your brain that can critically analyze what's coming at you. Now that makes a lot of sense if a lion or a tiger is leaping out of the bushes at you. You don't need to critically analyze this. You need to fight it or run away. It's, it's all about survival at that moment. But the way we're wired is that if you, if you get a, a bill in the mail and it's six times what you thought it was going to be, your neurology responds as though a tiger is leaping out of the bushes and all your thinking goes back to the primitive part of your brain that's only concerned with survival. This part of your brain makes you easy to control. And that's the point that was, that was made here before, that if you, have, if you have a weakness, if that weakness is then exploited, you're much easier to control. And it's one of the elements that would be used in a very large, sophisticated campaign to get you from point A to point B. Point B being um, uh, believing in supporting the outcome that the people who are creating the campaign wanted to achieve in the first place. So that's a very, very, very interesting point. And one of the things about advertising that I've always noticed is that even in a 30 second ad, a 60 second ad, whatever it is, the first thing is kind of setting up the problem. It's that Hegelian dialectic, problem, reaction, solution. You may not have even known you had the problem. I mean, there are certain kinds of advertisers that will say, go ask your doctor if you have this problem. Before they saw it on television, they didn't even know it was a problem. So uh, advertising tends to, to uh, pr cr uh, present or create, in some cases, a problem. And then they, um, they, they create a, a reaction within you about that problem. And then they, then they show you the solution. And the solution is always that you purchase their products or services. That's how, that's how ads work. And this isn't confined to, um, to, to, to mercantilism. It isn't, it isn't confined to selling uh, you know, objects. It isn't confined to just selling services. It's, it also has expanded to selling um, political candidates, political campaigns, ideas, including war, everything under the sun. And, and I said I was going to hop around because this is a massive topic. But one of the ways that you protect yourself against unwanted subconscious influence is you ask yourself, what is the motive of the person or the organization that's wanting me to believe something? Whatever it is, you know, side left, side, side right. Team, team blue, team, team purple. It doesn't matter. Ask yourself, what is their motive? Almost as if you were a police detective, you know, qui bono, who benefits? That's the Latin phrase, qui bono means who benefits? And that's a question a detective asks when they walk into a room and there's a person lying dead on the floor. Who would have benefited by this person being, being murdered? And it can literally be the same thing you can ask yourself when anyone, whether it's, as I say, an individual in your, in your, in your life, someone on the television, a politician, it doesn't matter. Who, what, what is their motive? Who, who would benefit by me accepting this idea? And if it's you, if you really believe you would benefit, by all means, buy the product or service, go along with the policy or the program, but really ask, who, what is the motive here? Who, who would benefit beyond, beyond the simple uh, you know, phrases that are being repeated over and over again, beyond the slick television advertisements, beyond whatever else is part of this, of this program, who benefits? And that might help you begin to rationally and logically deduce what's happening and whether it is or it is not in your best interest to walk down that road. Okay, cool. Um, Heather Marnie, good to see you, Heather. Uh, here is DNC Duillo Central. Yes, we are selling a perception of self to aspire to and finally get confused with as it com combines with our present self perception. Yeah, th and that's that's another interesting point. Um, 
I, I had a, a person email me about several people emailed me about this topic, and one of the people was was correctly saying that we are even as children um, we we are having ideas um, beliefs that are being kind of installed or programmed into us, and sometimes it's it's you know most of the time it's really good, like you know um, don't don't play in the street. <laughs> you know, don't play with a fire. Don't stick your finger in an electrical outlet. Um, always say please and thank you. Um, you know, treat others as you would wish to be treated. There, there are all kinds of, if you think about it, beliefs and ideas that, that are deeply embedded within us that support us. And typically those are our caregivers, sometimes our teachers that install these beliefs within us. But sometimes those, those caregivers, sometimes those teachers, sometimes the experiences that we have when we're children or young adults or what have you, are, are, might be traumatic, or they might be beliefs that are limiting us in some way. They might be preventing us from, from really um, stepping forward and interviewing for a job that we really want. It might be something that's preventing us from, say, speaking in public. It might be preventing us from asking someone on a date that we're really attracted to. Um, it might be something that, that uh, when it's triggered, it creates anger and rage and that pushes people away. It's, it's myriad. It's, it's our whole lives. There's a very powerful book called The Kybalion, K-Y-B-A-L-I-O-N. It's it was written or the, the, it was translated in 1908 or something by the three initiates, whoever they were. It's supposedly ancient wisdom. And one of the first thing they say in the Kabbalion is all is mind. Everything is mind. That that's the most important aspect of being human. And that if you can learn to control your own mind, you can then begin to control and influence everything around you to your benefit rather than being controlled by it. Okay. Um, here is AJ. Hello, AJ. Families, teachers, friends, others' uh, role in social programming and gender biased norms, age bias perception, health and healing all has a strong control of, on our lives and you can reflect on it. Absolutely. That's kind of mirroring what I was just saying, that, that um, when you're when you're being raised, I think that the Jesuits, the Catholic order said, um, give me the boy until he's seven years old and I will show you the man. Meaning that from zero to seven, that programming that goes on is so massively important in who you become that if you have control over that age group, you can kind of program anything that you want. And the reason for this is, remember before I, I talked about the critical factor. This is the gatekeeper between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And, in, and when you present a new idea, whether it's speaking a new language or it's, it's, a, it's a new you know, politician or a new brand of soap or toothpaste to someone, it has to get through that gatekeeper. And that's difficult. Um, repetition is one of the ways you get through it. There are, there are several other ways, but repetition is the main way. Well, when somebody's zero to seven years old, there is no gatekeeper. It flows directly in. There's no filter whatsoever. This is why we say that children are like sponges. And from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense that you would have no gatekeeper because in order for that child to stay alive, especially if they're you know, living in a primitive situation thousands of years ago, it's best if they learn things as fast as possible. What's gonna kill them? What's gonna keep them alive? So there's no filter there. That filter comes into play sometimes between, sometime between the ages of seven and nine years old. So there's that Jesuit statement, give me the child, the boy, um, until he's seven years old and I will show you the man. In other words, they will program that child to be the man they want him to be. Okay. Um, here's Rio seven. I think it's even more complicated than that. Almost anyone can be manipulated, unfortunately. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with you. Um, we are herd animals. So one of the principles of, of mental control is your peer group. You know, if your peer group is all has the same belief, if they're all wearing the same clothes, 
if they all get a tattoo, if they all are significantly overweight, your chances of following them along whatever that path is, is enormous. Because to an animal that is, that is a herd animal, safety is within the herd. Safety is not being off by yourself. And this is another reason why when we are threatened, when we are frightened, we are more manipulable because we want to move towards the herd or what we perceive to be the herd. So one of the <clears throat> tactics and techniques that um, a marketer, a propagandist will use is that of the peer group. Four out of five Americans prefer this brand of raisin over that brand of raisin. Um, seven out of nine doctors recommend smoking, because they used to do that, smoking this kind of cigarette versus that kind of cigarette. They're harnessing that deeper herd mentality that we have. And unfortunately, um, science has reached this point where it fused with marketing and politics, where they know exactly all the different buttons to push to, to get us to move in the direction they want us to move in. Now, having said that, there are still things we can do to protect ourselves. So I said before, qui bono, who benefits? When you are considering uh, what policy to throw your support, support behind, what politician to throw your support behind, what product to buy, perhaps, how great to, to ask who benefits? What is the motive here? You know, is this a, a really good friend of mine who I trust who's saying, you know, I bought this, this deodorant and it's the best deodorant I've ever had. Um, is it someone you know? If it's someone you know, back to peer group, you can probably trust them more than you can trust an actor hired to stand, you know, in front of a camera that you saw on your television. And speaking of television, um, I mentioned how the Germans in the 1930s pioneered the use of radio. Um, along comes television. Television is even more powerful than the radio because not only do you now have a human voice that's speaking to you using all of the inflections that the human voice is capable, capable of to, to transmit meaning, including seriousness, um, it, can, it can transmit um, criticism, it can transmit incredulity, it can transmit sarcasm, it can transmit um, excitement and passion and power in a way that's very hard to do with the written word. Now you take television, now you have the images, and now you can get somebody emotionally involved to a greater degree, arguably, than you could just with the radio. So another way to protect yourself, I say, is turn off the television, you know? Or, or, or make sure that you're limiting your use of the television. The worst possible thing that I see with my clients are, are people who say that they leave the television on when they go to sleep at night. So when you're sleeping, that critical factor, that gatekeeper between conscious and subconscious is completely out of the way. And anything that's being spoken about on the television is going directly into your subconscious mind as though you were in a hypnotist chair. And you don't even know what's being discussed or, 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 or spoken about or broadcast or what have you. I mean, it could be the 11 o'clock news talking about murder and mayhem. Could be, could be commercials, could be all sorts of things. So I say that one of the most powerful things you can do to protect yourself uh, beyond qui bono, who benefits, is to turn off the television, to, to move more and more towards getting your news from the written form. And I'm not saying that's free of bias. It's not <laughs> at all. But at least it is starting to, to, to move away some of those other elements that can be used to convey meaning that have nothing to do with the actual substance. So if the person who's telling you something is dripping with sarcasm, or they're really passionate and excited about what they're talking about, that's going to influence you in a very powerful way. So if you read it, you start taking that stuff, some of that stuff out of there. All right, but really good point, Rio7. Uh, Sarah W. 
A guy was trying to sell me pest control for my home yesterday, and it was interesting to watch his sales tactic. Fear, running out of time, loss of my home, I'm a bad neighbor, give him a chance, etc. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. So, okay, so let's break this down. Um, this, is, this is great. Let me just see if I can make this smaller. Okay, so, so we talked about fear and how powerful fear is to motivate people and how when a person's afraid, they move from prefrontal cortex, that rational, logical, executive function of the brain to the lizard brain that's only concerned with survival. So, so bringing in the fear by saying, hey, you may lose your home, um, that, that activates a primal part of us. Saying that you're a bad neighbor, that immediately takes you out of the herd, right? So if all of my neighbors hate me now, um, from an evolutionary standpoint, I am vulnerable. That's a really scary place to be. Um, you know, that, that running out of time is scarcity. That's another powerful tool or element to, to persuasion and mind control. Saying that, look what happened with toilet paper. The, what was that, the year before last? The whole country ran out of toilet paper. And the, and the more that the, that the television news said, oh, here's a picture of these bare shelves, the more it activated this primal part in the mind of, oh my goodness, if I don't get out there and get toilet paper, what am I gonna do? And so people were buying all the toilet paper there was to buy. This tactic is used on a lot of things. We don't have time to, um, to debate this. Oh, really? We don't have time to debate this. We just have to do this. We just have to act. You know, vote yes now. Don't think about it. Just do it. Because we don't have time. Because if, you, if we run out of time, you, you may die. I mean, this, this is a powerful, these are powerful techniques. And it's, it's so cool that, that you, you know, listed all of those so quickly and probably what was a fairly short um, interaction with this person. Um, you know, the Hegelian dialectic of problem, reaction, solution would even be enhanced if he, you know, at night released some pests into your home. You got up in the morning and you saw these pests running around. He knocks on the door and you're like, oh my God, there's, you know, cockroaches in my house. And he's like, well, I'm here and we can deal with the cockroaches. He'd be like, yeah, sign up. I don't care what it costs. <laughs> and as crazy as that sounds, that's something that, I think we should look at, you know, what in our individual lives, what in our culture is being, is being stoked? What fears are being stoked? And who benefits by the solution that's presented to allay those fears? So great, great comment, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mental Fruitcake, God, I love that name. Does a constant stimulation from electronic devices have an effect on this? Um, yes. Yes, it does. And I would, um, okay, so, so here's one th th in a number of ways in no particular order. It is, it, we are told that by having blue light coming into our eyes, it, it makes it harder to sleep, especially if blue light is coming into our eyes, you know, in the hour before you try to go to bed at night. If any of you are having trouble sleeping, this is probably something worth paying attention to. And instead of looking at your device in the hour before you go to sleep or your television or whatever it is, a laptop and so on, uh, to read a book. See if that helps because the blue light that's coming out of your device is telling your, your mind, telling your, then telling your neurology, it's daytime, it's time to wake up. If you don't get adequate sleep, you are now in a constant state of stress where your thinking goes from the prefrontal cortex to the lizard brain. Now you're more easy to be controlled. Secondly, if you have a device in your hand all the time, it's almost like having um, a salesman or a saleswoman or a salesperson standing by your side all the time telling you what to think, what to do, and when to do it. Um, it's kind of a constant barrage of messaging. So this would then lead us to another way of defending yourself, which I said before, which is turn off the television. Another way of defending yourself then would be limit the amount of time you spend with any kind of electronic device. The next way it could be influencing you is one of the points in the teaser that I made, and that is what is subliminal messaging? 
So subliminal means sub below uh, your liminal awareness. Another way of saying this is subvisual, below your ability to perceive something with your eyes, or subaudible, below your ability to perceive something with your ears. When I say perceive, I mean consciously perceive something. Your subconscious mind can perceive things your conscious mind cannot. So for those of you who have used my content on my YouTube channel, which is Blue Sky Hypnosis, subscribe if you haven't, um, I make a lot of subliminal content. And in the case of, of the work that I do, it's primarily subaudible. So on one of my tracks, say for weight loss, you might um, be uh, listening to an eight or nine hour track while you're sleeping. So remember what I said, when you're sleeping, you're, the gatekeeper moves out of the way. Now your subconscious mind is wide open to anything that's being put in there. And instead of consciously hearing the words that I'm saying, you're hearing, say, the sound of ocean waves. You're hearing the sound of rain. You're hearing the sound of gentle uh, instrumental music. But your subconscious mind is perceiving what is underneath all that. It's being masked, if you will, by those other sounds, like the nature sounds. I'm just one guy working with um, you know, a, a free audio editor on the web. Oh my God, what are corporations capable of? What are governments capable of? And I'm not saying that uh, subliminal content is being used in that particular uh, medium, and this is how it's being used. I think it's way, way too sophisticated for that. But just know that that technology exists. The technology exists to change our brain state using frequencies. And the technology exists to pass something off sub-visually or sub-audibly to go right into your subconscious mind and begin to control your behavior. Um, there was a movie, a low-budget movie, that was made in the early 80s, and it was called They Live. And in this movie, everything looks normal walking on a street, and this guy puts on a pair of these sunglasses, and when he has the sunglasses on, he can see that the billboard that says, hey, enjoy a vacation in the Swiss Alps, actually says, obey, obey the government, pay your taxes. And the whole idea was that, that we were surrounded by subliminal messaging. We were surrounded by subliminal content. So that would be another way that electronic devices could, and I'm, and I'm saying could because I'm not saying yes for sure this is happening, but it could be done. It's a powerful tool that could be used. And if it's not being used, then we are being governed by and, and marketed to by very um, kind and beneficent individuals who are choosing not to use a very powerful tool. All I'm saying is it, is it is another possibility, something that could be used. I actually had a person that wrote to me yesterday on my channel and said that he or she was not a fan of subliminal tracks. This was, I can't remember what it was subliminal for. Let's say it was weight loss. And, and I wrote back and I said, well, A, I put excerpts of what's in the track in the description so you can read that. I mean, you would then have to trust me that what I'm writing there is correct. But then I said, B, there's no guarantee that if you're listening to an audible track, that there isn't a subliminal component to that. How would you know? It's just something to be aware of. All right, but great, great point that you made there. Um, and I love the mental fruitcake, awesome. AJ says, how to reverse those multiple negative perceptions programming we are raised with? Can you share tools and methods? Yes, absolutely. So I wanna start with um, what can be done um, sort of without working one-on-one, -on -one, right? And the content that I make on my channel is all created with that in mind. You know, what, what can, what can the, this vast majority of people who are interested in bettering their lives, what are tools that I can make if I don't know who that person is? I have to make this something that's kind of generic. What's a generic tool that, that that person out there who wants to lose weight, who doesn't want to be stressed out, who wants to be able to speak in public, who wants to uh, be able to get better scores on their, their test results, who wants to have um, 
a better experience with finances and money, a better experience in relationships, et cetera, et cetera, et sleep better, et cetera, et cetera. What can I create to help them? So if you go to my channel, Blue Sky Hypnosis on YouTube, everything that's on there is designed to help people with particular issues. <clears throat> so that's one of the tools that you can use. And those tools would use hypnosis. And hypnosis is basically moving that gatekeeper out of the way so you can communicate directly with the subconscious mind. It's gonna use repetition. In some cases, and it's gonna be labeled clearly, you can use the subliminal aspect of it. And you can read the, the comment section and you can read thousands and thousands of people have benefited from using those tools. The next layer would be, um, how can you identify what the problem is, what the, what the limitation is, what the block is? So for example, if, if you had a weight loss program, a problem, and it wasn't being solved by listening to one of these tracks, you could use, um, and I have one here, you could use a pendulum like this. This is a tool for communicating with your subconscious mind. I have a video on my channel that teaches you how to use a pendulum. You can then use the pendulum to pinpoint or determine, is there a trauma in my past that is creating this block? So, you know, if a person weighs 232 pounds and they're five foot four, and you know, they really need to weigh something like, I don't know, 120, 130 pounds, and they use these other tools and they go from 232 down to 210 and they can't, they can't move past that. Something is stopping them from moving past that. You could use a pendulum as a tool to figure out what that block is. Now that block is generally going to be some kind of a trauma. So if you can pinpoint or isolate that trauma, then um, you're, you're beginning to recreate what I do with, with my clients in one-on-one -on -one sessions. Once you know what that trauma is, you need to reverse that trauma in your subconscious mind. Now, this is a little bit trickier to do that. Um, one of the tools for that would be a regression, regressing back in your mind, in your consciousness to the moment that that trauma occurred. And maybe even going back in your present adult body if it happened when you were a child, comforting the child. Um, forgiveness is another way. Um, there are other tools, and I'm gonna be making a video on on a tool called havening. Havening is a really simple tool to reprocess a trauma. Um, you, can, you can definitely look that up. And um, as I say, I'm gonna be making a video on that, teaching you how to use that, how to do that for yourself. Um, but in my experience, you can use kind of mainline hypnosis, and I have videos on my channel. The next thing you can do is you can pinpoint, if that's if you're being blocked, you can pinpoint what is the underlying trauma that has created that issue in the first place. And then once you've pinpointed that, you wanna work on resolving that trauma in your subconscious mind. Age regression is one of the tools of doing that. That's, that's something that I do with my clients constantly. Another one is this tool called havening. Um, I think I can even make a, a really, well, I'll make a video on it. That's probably the best way of doing it. Um, and yeah, and then, if, and then if, if you're still getting stuck with all that, then contact me. We can work on that and resolve it for you and get past that block. At that point, once you're past the block, you wanna keep reinforcing in your subconscious mind the ideas and beliefs that you want there. This also leads me to another concept that's very, very, very powerful. As humans, we learn primarily through modeling. We learn primarily through mirroring, emulating. When you watch television, when you are watching your devices, one of the ways in which you're being programmed is through modeling and mirroring. So I, I'm, you know, I'm 60 years old. When I was in my 20s, when I was in my 30s, um, no, very, very, very few people had tattoos. And the people that had them tended to be like bikers, people who um, you know, were in the Navy for 30 years, people who were incarcerated. You didn't tend to see tattoos just on the rest of the population. Now, my perception is, wow, they see, everybody seems to have a tattoo. One of the ways in which this promulgates through a society 
as I said before, is through mirroring. Like a celebrity is very powerful. People have powerful feelings toward a celebrity because they've seen the celebrity on television, in the movies, on talk shows, and they sort of, you know, look up to them. They're, you know, an image of this person is presented often beautiful and sexy and masculine and powerful and virile and smart and successful and all of these, these wonderful adjectives. And so we sort of look up to these people. And if you've been kind of programmed by watching this person, you know, for a long period of time, and now they appear on a talk show or something, and they've got their sporting a tattoo, and and the, the talk show host is like, oh wow, that's so sexy, that's an amazing blah 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 blah, and then you see someone else with one, and then your friend shows up with one. You are a herd animal. <laughs> you feel safe when you're doing and thinking and behaving like the herd, especially when you're scared or stressed out. So as this concept is presented to you over and over again, it starts to become more appealing to your subconscious mind as a way of fitting in, as a way of, of maybe being successful. Because here's the thing with like celebrities, and it's the reason why they're used to advertise stuff, is another concept of, of subconscious influence is linking. So you, you subconsciously link um, a person you admire with a product, with a service, with a new fashion, including haircuts and tattoos and so forth. And all of that is, in essence, orchestrated by much larger entities. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly how I got on this, but this is something to be aware of, that oh, modeling, that you wanna, you wanna be sure that what you're taking in through your eyes and your ears is what you want coming back out in terms of your health, your relationships, um, the success that you have in your life, everything. What goes in then comes back out. So um, another way of countering negative programming is to, is to select the programming you want, take that programming in, because that's then going to affect your life on the way back out. You take control of the programming. And it is kind of interesting that television says that the lineup that they have, the offering they have for you to watch, is called programming. That's either a mistake or we named it programming because that happened first, but it's a fascinating uh, quinky dink, as they say. All right, um, how much time we have here? We've got about 11 minutes left. Okay, um, before I go into some more of the, the comments and questions that people have, and I love that you guys are making these comments and questions, or as usual, they add so much to the conversation and they, they really help take it in directions that we might not have gone into. Um, I want to talk about next Friday, next Friday, live at five. So my intention is to do, and I just want to put that up on the screen. My intention is to do something on dreams, um, tentatively thinking about dream analysis. Now, I'm a little nervous about this one only because I think, I mean, I can talk about dreams for a while because this is one of the, the components that I regularly use with my clients my one-on-one -on -one clients is I'll talk about, you know, what, what, what is the weirdest dream you've ever had in your life? The weirder, the better. Um, what have you ever had a recurring dream? Did you have a dream last night? These are the categories that generally are the most powerful in terms of eliciting what's going on in the subconscious mind, because dreams, in my opinion, is a form of communication from your subconscious mind. But the subconscious mind doesn't speak the way we expect it to speak. It speaks in metaphor. And so if you analyze the dream based upon metaphor, it's suddenly this, this opaque, strange, well, that was a weird dream. I was walking in a department store and I only had my underwear on and there was a, a pink elephant and then, you know, whatever. It's just like, wow, it was weird. And we just kind of tend to push it away because it doesn't make any sense to us. And yet those dreams in my experience, tend to have powerful um, messaging that the subconscious is trying to get through to us. Now, in order to do this, it seems to me that I might need some people to come forward, you guys, and say, share your, share your dreams so we can, we can talk about this. 
So again, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of going out on a limb to do this. And, and I know I asked this before, but I'm asking again, if it makes sense to you, if you'd like to see this next Friday's Live at 5, please pop something in the comment section. And if you want to share a dream that you've had, the weirdest dream you've ever had, or a recurring dream, or something that happened recently, and you want to send that to peter at blueskyhypnosis.com, please do that. And that'll give me some time to kind of to look it over. And if it makes sense, bring that forward into the discussion. But, you know, let me know if you think a dream for a live at five, a dream analysis thing makes, makes sense to you. All right. I want to go back to a few more um, comments and questions um, before we wrap it up. All right. So here is Katie. Hello, Katie. Katie Johnson. My mom and my horse trainer told me in my teen years, 20, how a boy or dating would stop me from, um, I think nationals, like maybe national competition or any success. Yeah. So I believed it. So I believed it for years and years and hard to break the fear. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's an example of what sounds like really good natured people that undoubtedly just wanted the best for you installing or programming you with an idea that sounds like it's now holding you back. So the two broad ways of approaching how to deal with this is number one, you, you flood your subconscious mind with the opposite message. Now, the thing that's important to remember about the subconscious is that its job, its role is to protect you. And here we have a perfect example because they were saying to you, if you want success, you can't do this thing, right? The, the, the boy, the male, the romantic um, relationship is going to bar or prevent you from having this other experience that you really want. So it was set up as kind of a protective um, um, mechanism, a protective concept. So the opposite of that, flooding the subconscious mind with the opposite of that is, I am safe to have this experience. I, 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 I am successful um, with and without a romantic partner. Um, having, having a loving, supportive relationship actually allows me to be more successful than I already am. And by flooding the subconscious mind, when I say flooding, what I mean is repeating over and over again, not just doing the track once, but doing it multiple times, like, you know, uh, every day, uh, sleeping with a track like that, with repeating this, this message so that you can drive it through that critical factor, get it into the subconscious mind where it holds on to it, <clears throat> and that may change the belief. If that doesn't work, then step number two is in your mind, we take you back to the moment at which you accepted their idea. So the first time they said it to you might not have been the moment at which you accepted the idea and turned it into a belief. Now, belief is an idea and an emotion that get married. Boom, now you have a belief. There's a moment that that belief was created and it may not be, as I said, the first time they presented it to you. It may have been the fifth time and maybe the 30th time or whatever, but to take you back in your mind to the moment at which you accepted the belief and you go back as an adult, say, and help your younger self understand why that's not true and how it's not really their fault that they were well-meaning and maybe we even get them involved and again this is all in your mind where they say oh i can see how this affected you and i'm so sorry and now i see that that's not true and i and i want to and i want and i want you to accept a new belief it all sounds kind of imaginary but in the province of your subconscious mind it becomes real so step one, flood your subconscious mind with the opposite. I am safe to be in a loving, supportive relationship. In fact, I can be more successful in a loving, safe, supportive relationship. Step number two, you find the moment at which the block, the obstacle was created, and you work through a variety of methods at releasing that block, at healing the block. And this all happens in your consciousness, and the way I work is in hypnosis. So hopefully that that helps. Hopefully that description makes sense. All right. Um, uh, yeah, that's why cartoons are full of subliminals um, that influence the minds of children. This is kind of shocking. 
And you can definitely go on and watch videos of people who have assembled uh, clips or examples of cartoons that have, for example, uh, very shocking um, kinds of imagery that happens very quickly. So, um, you know, you're watching this movie and the frames, I can't remember how many frames, 30 frames per second or something is in a film. One frame in that 30 will be, will be kind of a vulgar image or the vulgar image will be, will be part of something else that looks like the night sky <clears throat> or looks like smoke. But if you freeze that image and you look at it, you can see exactly what it is. Why that would be in a children's film is, is beyond me. But that's a really good point. And something that, if you're interested, is worth um, researching. Check it out. <clears throat> now, this is a very interesting question by Sarah. Uh, when we are young and don't have a good filter, does our soul still oversee our safety and stand in as some sort of filter for us? Well, it is said in hypnosis, this is what is said, that you will not, even in hypnosis, act against your moral code or your moral compass. I don't know that that's really your soul. And I think there are cases where people will act against their moral code or their, their moral compass when enough persuasion has been delivered to them over a long enough period of time. And each person is a little bit different. And how much pressure is being put on that person? You know, is their whole peer group putting pressure on them? Is it just that they have a teacher that's whatever? Um, does the soul protect you when you're a child and you don't have the filter in place? I think it really depends on what you're saying. Protect you against what? Um, and, I, and, and without knowing exactly what we're talking about, I would say, sadly, my opinion right now, is no, it doesn't. I think, I think that kind of protection of our sort of eternal spirit is on a different level. And I think our education and our rehabilitation occurs after our physical death. But I think in this life, sadly, a child is extremely vulnerable to being influenced and being um, controlled by anyone that has access to that children, from the primary caregivers to um, a school, um, to any kind of electronic media that that child is consuming. Uh, I think all of those elements are, are able, sadly, to uh, influence that child. And I think that this is one of the reasons why throughout history, um, I believe that we have really wanted to protect children. We have recognized how vulnerable they are, not just physically, but also psychically and emotionally. And, you know, back to that Jesuit quote, give me the, give me the, 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 the boy until seven years old and I will show you the man. That's an old, old quote. So I wish I could, I wish I had the opinion that it was different. And maybe there's, there's, a, there's a mechanism that, that can kind of rescue us, like a, like a deeper thing that can come online at some point. So even if someone's going down uh, you know, a, a road, like an ethical or a moral compass of some kind that, kick, that may kick in at a certain point, um, you know, that, that a person might end up doing some kind of heinous things in their life or they may go down a very destructive path. And at some point they may, they may you know, we've, we've all known people like this. They turn a corner and they, they change their lives. Well, I guess you could say, what is that part that's causing them to choose a different path after they'd been walking down a very dark path? That could be described perhaps as their soul or their spirit coming through or communication with um, you know, non-physical entities like spirit guides or ascended masters or with God. I, I, I think that's possible, um, but it's an awesome question and thank you for asking. Thanks for being here. <clears throat> All right, um, let's do one more. Um, 
So uh, Mary Lou is asking, hi, is it safe for people with frontal lobe brain injury? And I think Mary Lou is asking about hypnosis and maybe asking about doing the tracks on the YouTube channel. My answer to that would be, you know, talk to your licensed professional who knows you, who knows your situation or the person that you're speaking about and ask their opinion. Say, this is something that I'm considering doing. Um, is that safe for me to do? That would be the right person to, to um, you know, answer that question so that you or the person you're talking about remains, you know, safe and healthy and, and all that good stuff. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, folks. I really appreciate this. And this this went so fast. Um, I, I suspected that it, it would because it's such a massive topic. If there are aspects of this topic that you would like to see again in a future Live at Five, <clears throat> please put that in the comment section or send me an email at peter at blueskyhypnosis.com and say, you know, here's, here's a part that I think I'd like to go a little bit deeper into or you know, maybe a few weeks down the road if you want to if you want to tackle this again or what have you, because it really is a big topic. And I feel like an hour doesn't really do it justice. But it was important for me, for whatever reason, to scratch the surface on this one this time. So thank you to all of you who showed up today, for all of you who made comments, um, who asked great questions uh, for your participation. I really appreciate you live at Fivers and look forward to seeing you next Friday live at five. If this one makes sense to you and I'll look at the um, at the comments that I wasn't able to get to in during the, the live section as soon as we as we part for the weekend. So have a great weekend and we'll see you next Friday live at five. Take care.